Good afternoon. I'm Betsy Camp, and on behalf of myself and my co-chair, Milton Jones, I welcome you to the NACD Atlanta Chapter's March Signature Event. We are very excited that so many people registered to join us. And you can see all the attendees in the link contained in the chat function, which as we all know by now is at the bottom of the screen. Today, the Atlanta chapter is honored to have as our speaker, Carol Tomei, Chief Executive Officer of UPS. Carol is here to share her journey from board member to CEO of the logistical, of the logistics giant in what we call reaching the top. The format will be a fireside chat with our own Connie Engel facilitating. There will be Q&A after the presentation, but questions can be submitted at any time by use of the chat or Q&A feature. And finally, this event is being recorded and will be sent out to members in a post event email. But first, I need to recognize our Atlanta sponsors whose support makes our programming possible. Thank you, Austin and Bird, EY, Grant Thornton, Houlihan Loki, King and Spalding, KPMG, Meridian Compensation Partners, Paradigm Advisory, Pearl Meyer, Protivity, PWC, RSM, and Stout. Thank you. This meeting represents a milestone in that Connie and Carol are speaking live from the UPS studio. And this is the first live event NACD Atlanta has had since March of last year. So hopefully it portends fully live meetings in the near future. So without further ado, I'm turning it over to you, Connie. Thanks, Betsy. And um... Thank you, Carol. Hi, I did not know we were going to be recognized as the first in person, even though it's in person with two people. <laughs> um, we've we've done this before, and it's fun to be able to sit and talk. To it's you. so good to see you. Good to see you as well. And um, I was thinking earlier in preparing for this that the last time I really saw you for a period of time was at your retirement party. Yes. And so I thought, <laughs> so how's that going? My retirement. Oh, okay. Not so much, um, but I will ask you a little personal question. So between retirement and starting at UPS, did you and Ramon have any time to do anything fun? Did you get to retire at all? Well, you know, we were starting the next chapter of our lives. And so I had gone on a couple of corporate boards, yeah. stood up our family office and our family foundation. Right. Uh, we were spending a ton of time at our 550 acre farm in North Georgia. So we were moving on. And then the UPS came a call <laughs> and it caused me to, to pause and say, really, what should I be doing with my next chapter? And, you know, I thought about it a lot. Um, why would I come back into the workforce? But this was a really compelling call. First of all, this is a values-based company and my values align with UPS values. So that you know, was really important to me right. to align to the values and to the good that UPS does in the world. That was super important to me. Secondly, I had been on the board for a long, long time and I was puzzled by all the capital we had poured into the company and the fact that we weren't getting the right returns on that capital and the stock had been flat for about six years. And I'm like, I think I could do something and, and create value for share owners. And you know, I like to make money. So I'm like, yeah. that, that, that was a compelling call. And then we have 540,000 people who work for us. And I love to develop people. And I'm like, gosh, if I could come on board and actually help people reach their highest potential, whatever it may be for them, that would be cool. And finally, you know, having gone through a, now a, a board search for an outside CEO, I realized how tough that is for boards. Mm -hmm. So I thought if I come here and I can work to get CEO successor, succession candidates ready whenever it is time for me to leave, then that would really be cool. So the board then they'll pick whomever they want, but at least they would have candidates that were ready to be selected. So anyway, when I looked at all those opportunities, it was pretty compelling. And then I talked to Ramon and I'm like, what do you think? And he's like, you know, Carol, that old saying, I married you for life, but not for lunch. He said, would you please go back to work? I was 
was driving him crazy, seriously. Because yeah. every day I was like, what are you doing today? Yeah. And who are you having lunch with? And he was like, yeah. Right, right, right. So, so it was a good thing for our family too. Well, and he'd been retired for a couple of yeah, years, that's right? it. He, he was living his own life. You know, you get into it, when you move into retirement, you do move into your next chapter. And right. he was fully living that chapter in, in ICOM and kind of disrupting right. that a bit. Right. So the daily, the, uh, daily structure changes. Totally. With your book. It's interesting. I totally, <laughs> totally get that. Um, so we, we kind of um, set this whole discussion up to talk about the uniqueness of going from the board yes. to CEO. Yes. So what did you find, uh, you know, what did you learn when you made that transition? Yeah. What do you see as the big challenge? And yeah. tell us more about that. I learned a lot. Um, as board members, we actually fly pretty high. You know, we, we hear what management wants to tell us. <laughs> we drop into our board meetings four or five times a year. The heavy lifting takes place in the committees, of course. So you get to know the company pretty deep if you're on the audit committee or the comp committee or the risk committee. But at the board, you fly pretty high. Mm -hmm. And I learned a lot of things when I came in that I didn't know as a board member which is actually influencing how I want to communicate to our board because I think we can do a better job of being a bit more transparent in all candor. The, yeah, then we can talk more about that. That was a big learning for me. The other learning was it's really weird to move from being a peer with your fellow board members to all of a sudden having 12 <laughs> to 15 bosses Right. And they all have points of view on what you should be doing. Really? Oh. Yes, they do. <laughs> <laughs> You've got to be respectful to all those points of view and spend time, more time listening than talking. It's, it's just a very different role. Right. And fortunately, um, and I didn't realize this at the time, but I do now, we split the chair and the CEO role. And that actually was really helpful for me because having a chair is someone I can talk to. Right. Yeah. And, and, and not get as many incoming voices from, you know, and I do listen to all the directors, but having a chair who can kind of gather voices is helpful rather than trying to manage them all. Right. I think you were the first, you were the first CEO that didn't start by yes. loading ba boxes, right? Absolutely. So what have you done? Because I know you got you were very active and actively involved at the stores, at yes. the people stores. Yes. So what have you done to bridge that gap since you weren't able to come in yeah. having started that way? So the announcement that I was coming in as CEO was March 12th of last year. And my plan was March 12th? Yeah, March 12th, right. My plan was I'm gonna spend time traveling the world meeting UPSers, walking our facilities, talking to customers. I had this grandiose plan. A week after I was announced, we sent everyone home because of COVID. So those plans went out the window. Mm -hmm. But what I was able to do is I was able to go deep into our business models, really pull things apart, which helped inform the strategy that I wanted to lead with the team, lead us to. It also allowed me to spend time, really quality time with people. Because you know, when you're on a world tour, you're out there shaking hands with everybody. Hey, 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 you may say a few words and then you move on to the next meeting. Now I'm just zooming away and going deep and talking to UPSers. And, you know, I learned very quickly, like in the first week, I'm like, do we measure satisfaction? And they're like, yes, yes, we do. I'm like, well, what's our employee satisfaction? And the response was, well, we measure it by likelihood to recommend. <laughs> and our likelihood to recommend was 51% which meant 49% of UPSers would not recommend us as a place to work. I'm like, oh no, that's not gonna work for me. So I, I started to find out why, and I talked to people and people were really willing to give me um, their feedback as to why, things that we could change. So that was a blessing in a way. Right. You know, I wasn't out working in the facilities, right, right. Uh, but I was able to listen to people. Now I have, I have been in some of our facilities. So our largest air hub is in Louisville, Kentucky. We call it Worldport. Mm -hmm. So I have been to Worldport. I have been in, on a ride along with one of our driver's delivery packages. So that was an incredible experience. You know, we were all masked up, of course, but I was in my UPS Browns. Do you know our UPS drivers on average walk 10 miles a day? No. They drive a lot, but they also walk a lot. 10 miles a day. I'm like, this is awesome. You get your, <laughs> you get your steps yep, in. You get your Perfect. steps in. Perfect. So I've, I've done, done some of that. I've been to some of our facilities, but nothing like I wanted to, but trying to make it work as much as I, I can. So you got used to Zoom really quickly. Got used to Zoom. 
Yeah. Yeah. Aren't we all used to Zoom? Yes. Aren't we all just tired of Zoom? <laughs> yes. I get like a little crick in my neck sometimes, don't you? It's like, yeah. oh my gosh. Yeah. Well, I do think it's nicer than a conference call. It's old- so much better than a conference call. Right. It's so much better. And what I've seen our team do, which is pretty cool, is they're trying to have fun with Zoom too. So you know, they've had costume parties right. and, you know, oh. they, they, you know, they, you know, they brought their kids to work and just, you know, try to make it um, more, more real. So it's not just talking about the business, but talking about their lives. Cause pe- this has been hard for people, right? Oh my gosh. It's been so hard for people. Yeah. It's something that a hundred years from now, they'll look back on it's right. and talk about it. I don't think we've lost any productivity, but for sure, I worry about connectivity. You know, that moment when you're walking by and you stop in someone's office. Yeah. Right. We've just onboarded five new directors since I came here. Really? Five new directors. They have never been together in a meeting. We're Zooming the meeting. So they've not met each other. Isn't that weird? That is, we, we, did the, we did the recruiting via Zoom. And these are outstanding. I'm thrilled with our directors. Extraordinarily diverse. Um, we've brought in uh, three women and two African-American men. It's pretty awesome. Great. We've got one of the most diverse boards in the, in the country now. So how... Okay, how do you go about picking these people? Yeah, so we started with a, a skills assessment and a gap assessment. What skills do we want on our board that we don't have? So we did that work. Uh, we worked with a recruiting firm. I was going to ask you if you we, did. We did, okay. uh, but we also leveraged our personal relationships. And not wanting to bring friends, because that's always dangerous. Right, right. Uh, but wanting to bring people that you knew would fit in with the rest of the board, given that it was a different kind of recruiting, mm. where you didn't have the belly to belly, you know, take somebody out for lunch or dinner or whatever. So it was important that the culture fit was going to work. And, and thus far, could just over the moon, happy with our, our board selection. Well, won't it just be nice? When everybody can get back together. It'll be so nice. And what is your sense? Do you think it's coming sooner or later? So, you know, President Biden said that Americans will be vaccinated by the end of May. And our data says that's true. Now, people have to want to get vaccinated. Right. uh, But we certainly have enough vaccine. We'll have enough vaccines available in the marketplace to vaccinate um, 100% of the addressable market in the United States, which is those Americans 18 and older. Nice. Well, I can't imagine, first of all, I can't imagine coming in in the midst of a pandemic. We've already talked about that. But then a few months later, suddenly you've got dealings with the pandemic. You've got your Christmas, your normal Christmas traffic. You've got uh, delivery of these vaccines. What challenges did that provide you towards the end of the year? How did you plan for that? Well, or could you? Well, yeah, Connie, it was really quite, quite um, chaotic for a while. First, when COVID hit, I'm just going to take you back to March. Yeah. We had to ensure that we had the right to be an essential worker because we are essential, but we didn't really have the right because we didn't have all the necessary PPE. You know, we deliver packages in 220 countries and territories around the world. Every day we're moving 3% of the world's GDP. We didn't have the masks, the gloves, the hand sanitizers, the cleaning necessarily. So we had to scurry to get the right products in to protect our UPSers, our workers, so that they could remain essential. Then we started to see demand fall through the floor. And we're like, oh no. Really? Is when, the business... when was that? When was well, the it was right when everything kind of shut before people realized that they could start to order online. Everybody okay. was freaking out, right? Okay. So then demand softened. We're like, oh no. And then it started to grow again. So we're ready for the business. We don't know where the business is going to go and it takes off. So we see the highest demand we've ever seen in our company history and we didn't have enough people. So in the second quarter of last year, we had to hire 40,000 workers to deliver these packages in the United States alone, 40,000 workers to deliver the packages because the demand was crazy and the demand shifted. So the penetration of the business was about 70% residential. Everybody was ordering, having their essential goods sent to their homes. So that was an experience and we got through that. And then we were looking to your question about the holidays, because right. holidays is what we call peak. Typically, that's when e-commerce sales peak up, when right. people are, are, are ordering over the, the, the Christmas holiday time, Christmas, Hanukkah, Kwanzaa, you know, that December time frame. So we're like, okay, we've got to get ready for that. 
And we were really nervous about our ability to do so because what we were seeing in the industry was a demand capacity imbalance. There was more demand than there was capacity. So we started working with our customers back in July to say, and about 300 customers make about 80% of our holiday volume. So we started working with them saying, okay, if you look at the players, UPS, FedEx, the post office, Amazon, there's only so much availability. So we, we're gonna have to work with you on how we bring your volume into our network. We may not be able to pick you up on this day, but we can pick you up on that day. We can still deliver your packages, but it's gonna have to be different than it has been in the past. So we started working with our customers back in, in, in July, which was so smart, because had we not done that, we would have had real chaos when the holiday came. Right. Then we hired 100,000 temporary <laughs> workers, 100,000 temporary workers to manage this volume, including um, we had personal vehicle drivers. So we would hire people who would drive their own cars to, to deliver uh, packages or helpers that would sit in a package car with a UPS driver to deliver packages. Hmm. And it was the combination of that and some new tools and really cool technology tools that we deployed allowed us to manage this unprecedented volume, the highest volume in our company history with the outstanding service levels. So we compare our service levels against our competitors and it's done by a third party. We had better service levels in each of the seven weeks of peak than our competitors. And we did it in a pretty effective way. So we reported our highest quarterly profit in the fourth quarter. We had the highest sales and profit in our company history last year. So I really thank you, <laughs> but I attribute that to the UPS team. You know, the men and women of UPS are pretty, pretty amazing folks. How did you fold in then the vaccine deliveries? Yeah. Because those were yeah. unique and- So unique. Yeah. So we've been in the healthcare business for 15 years. So we um, have invested heavily in uh, cold chain logistics and the ability to move a vaccine. So think about it. We've been delivering uh, influenza vaccines or small packs vaccines. So we understand this space. We invested in freezer farms. So we have a freezer farm in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, and in the Netherlands. We invested in the manufacture of dry ice because we knew that some of these vaccines Brilliant. would need to have dry ice go along with them. So we can make up to 1,200 pounds of dry ice an hour. So we were invested and then we're like, okay, when is, when are we going to get approval to, to ship them? We didn't know, right? We didn't know. We reserved capacity in the network. Okay. So we said, we, based on our best intelligence, we were, we were a member of Operation Warp Speed from the get-go. So, you know, we best, uh, based on intelligence, we reserved capacity. So when the FDA did approve the Pfizer vaccine, we were ready, we were ready to go. Really nice. Um, well, so let's, Let's talk a little bit more business now. That, that's kind of more um, what was going on at the time, which is a lot. But at the same time, I think when you came into UPS, you had some ideas of, you know, uh, new visions. And so tell us a little bit yeah. about what your vision was, regardless of all the <sighs> things in the world happening. Well, yeah. So, you know, I, I was taking the chair on June 1st and I had... Uh, pre-recorded a video, video to go out to all UPSers about, you know, what we were going to do and we were going to have some fun and we we're going to kick some ass, you know, we, you know, it was really sort of an aspirational, inspirational uh, right. video. And then the George Floyd killing happened. And I'm like, well, I can't put that video out. People are going to think I'm totally insensitive. And I sat down on my kitchen table and I was actually in tears because I was just so, I was just, I was ashamed. I was mad. I was like, this is just not, this is not our country. So I penned a note about how I wanted to turn my anger into action by living our values. And we ran the note before the video went so that the UPSers understood that this company was not gonna stand on the sidelines when it comes to racism or bigotry, that we were gonna be active. Right. And we immediately took action in, in that regard because that was one of the things that I knew that we had to do. We had to be that beacon on the hill where everybody would look and say, that company is doing it right when it comes to you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion. And so that was a big piece of what had to happen immediately. And then there was a look at the, just the happiness of our people and what we needed to do there. And part of it was just pushing the decision rights to the people. We ran the company by committee. We had 21 committees. And you had to wait till a committee met to get an idea discussed and probably not approved. 
because then it had to go into analysis. And it was like, oh my gosh, you know, we gotta be working on the speed of a, a watch, not a calendar. So we knocked out all those committees and we went down to like six review boards and that's sped up because the world around us is changing. Our competitors are changing, our customers are changing and the rate of change is accelerating. So we really tried to accelerate decision and bubble up innovation, which is a pretty important exercise. We put together um, a, a, a model to create value for the share owners a total shareholder return model, 30,000 hours went into this model. I mean, lots of hours, lots of people working on this. And then we shared it with the team. I'm like, look, you know, we've got a path here to create real value for the, for the share owners, which, oh, by the way, are you? And they're like, ah, nah, the stock doesn't move. And we're like, yes, the stock can move. We can do this if we were going to have to change. We're going to have to change how we think about capital allocation. We're going to have to change how we think about um, our pricing, we're just gonna need, you're gonna need to change how we think about our costs, we need to change. And so we started to lean into what we call better, not bigger, which was don't just grow and fill up the pipe. Think about um, operationalizing and, and, and rationalizing the network to get the highest return off of the network. And we started to do that. And it's actually started to take traction, which is cool. We took our capital spending down by a billion dollars in the year. In the same time, we looked at customer pain points and one of the customer pain points was uh, speed. We were took too, too much time in transit, took too long to get a package to you. So I'm like, and we had an initiative underway called our fastest ground ever initiative. And it was supposed to conclude in June of this year, 2021. I'm like, well, what's getting in the way? And the team said money. I'm like, we have money. <laughs> so we pulled it forward. We pulled it forward and got it done in October of last year. And our customers, loved it and moved business from the post office and other competitors to us because they loved the experience and we grew that space. So that was be really being better, not yeah. bigger. We didn't right. add anything. We just got better. The experience got better. So we've been operating under that strat strategic framework for a while now uh, under three big pillars, customer first, people led, innovation driven, but it's all about better, not bigger. Uh, clearly it's, it's working. And it's, you, you can tell. What, have you seen pushback? I mean, what's it been challenging there? I can't imagine everybody was like, sure, let's just do all of those things. Yeah, so it's about selling the dream, right? It's <laughs> right. about selling the dream. Right. And we made it real. It's, it's and, you know, and I had some experience doing this in my old life where it was selling the dream and said, this is what it can mean for you personally, because everyone has a stock grant. I'm like, right. this is what it can mean for you right. personally if we do this and what it could mean for you and your families. If we do this, you know, you may, you could have that dream house or you could give it all away. I mean, there's wealth is a crazy thing, right? You can do some amazing things with it. So we made it real. Um, and also just started to, to listen to people rather than we were, and, and we're 114 years old, an engineering driven company and very much sort of like command and control. That worked really well mm -hmm. for a long, long time. I and mean, we are the largest logistics company in the world. It worked. It doesn't work anymore. The workforce of today, mm -mm, command and control don't work so much, right? They want to be heard. They want to be empowered. They want to feel like they're in the game, you know, not being told what to do. So we started to change that. Are we perfect? Not, no way. But the likelihood to recommend has moved from 51 to 64. So better. Nice not where we need to be, right. <laughs> not where we're, no way. Um, it's a journey it, and there's no finish line here. Um, but I was really worried. I was worried I was gonna get, you know, like the, 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 the body was gonna reject the organ transplant, but I've seen nothing but real uh, reception. Now, we did change one thing. Um, we had a very strict appearance policy. So you couldn't have facial hair and you couldn't have natural hair. So if you were African-American, you couldn't have a fro or hair and braids. So yeah, so we, we changed that. I did hear from some retirees <laughs> who, were very, who weren't very happy with the change in the appearance policy, but I'm like, you know what? I really don't think our customers are, are, are paying us because we don't have facial hair. Yeah, tattoos, of course. Same thing with the tattoos? So. <laughs> We haven't touched the tattoo policy. Okay, sorry, yet. I shouldn't have brought it up. No, thank you no. for bringing it up. <laughs> okay. Because I've asked the team to look at tattoo policy. Yeah. Do you know that our tattoo policy is more restrictive than that of the um, armed forces? 
Hmm. Yeah. Yeah. They loosened that up a little bit. <laughs> they loosen up and they're still very respectful. You can't have, you know, right. you know, derogatory or terrible right. tattoos, but right. so we'll, we're taking a look at that. <laughs> One thing at a time. One thing at a time. <laughs> yeah, that's right. First hair. One thing. Tattoo. <laughs> I like it. It sounds silly, but it's not, no, it, it's no. not silly. It's and those meaningful. are the people that are working for you. Hello. Exactly. So let's talk about that. You got a half a million people yeah. that work for you. I know you so well, you wish you could meet every single one of I them. I do. So um, how do you get to all of the different levels so that people feel like they, they really know Carol Tomei? So I, I do skip level Zooms. Do you? I do, which is great. I love those. I do a lot of town halls. And then <laughs> when UPSers send me an e email, I read all the emails. No one screens my email. And so, and customers too. And I get a lot of customer feedback, <laughs> well, a whole lot. But, and, and then I respond. Um, and if, I, if it's something I can't address, then I have someone look into it. You know, if, it's, if, 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 if there's an allegation of bad behavior, I'll have somebody look into it. But I, but I respond. Um, we have something called upsers.com. And there are articles that are posted to upsers.com. And UPSers can comment on the articles. I read them all. And one person, I, and I said that, and I do these monthly videos called Wildly Important Videos. And so I try to talk to people what's wildly important to me. And I said, I read your emails. And one person posted, I bet you do. And I wrote him back, oh, yes, I do. <laughs> so, but I connect nice. to, I really try to connect with people. Mm -hmm. I wish I could do more though. It, to your point, it just breaks my heart that I, I, will, I will never know them all, ever. Yeah. I won't. Yeah. And it breaks my heart. Well, I can tell you, I bet they feel like they know you. Well, I hope they're getting to yeah. know me. Yeah. yeah. I think that's Because, you know, I, I there's this, this the CEOs sometimes are like are mysterious people. And I'm like, we're yeah. just people. Right. We're here to serve you. I'm not confused by that. I am not confused. I, I am at the bottom of the pyramid and you're at the top. Right. I am here to serve you. Wonderful article in the Wall Street Journal last weekend. Oh, thank you. Yeah, I enjoyed reading it. And I thought, Yep, yep, yep. She's doing she's doing all these really wonderful things. I knew she would. We uh, it was interesting because I was not interviewed for that article. Really, really, and so that's always a scary thing. They're yeah. like they're running a piece on you. I'm like really, and they're just going to run it. And I'm like, oh no. <laughs> but I'm like, oh, it's it's the weekend. Good. Nobody's going to read it. <laughs> well, I got many many copies of it. By the way, should you need one? Okay. Like, You're a friend of Carol's. Here, see this. So anyway, I got to well, see good. it multiple Thank times. Thank you. It was great. You. Thank you. Um, sticking with uh, people. And then what we're going to do is we're going to open it up to oh, questions from, uh, from the audience, all of you out there. Oh, good. Um, back, just people empowerment. You know, um, it's, it's effective leadership. We're talking about the fact that you'd like to meet everybody. But how do you get them to reach their full potential? Yeah. How, do you, how, how do you get the managers to have those conversations? Because this is... This is all a pretty new game for everybody. This is, this is a new game. This is a new game. We're building new muscle here. We are building new muscle. And it's really pushing the refresh button on expectations of leadership. You know, expectation, how we go about investing in our people, the way we invest in people, how we, you know, we, we tended to invest at a lower level. So their, their bosses didn't know what they were being taught. How are those messages ever reinforced? Right. Never. Right. And here you are, you're a younger person in your career, and you're trying to bring up all these fantastic ideas that you just learned at Emory or wherever. And the boss is like, I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, no, I'm not going to do that. So it's like you start here, you push it down. We launched uh, a series of training last year. One was unconscious bias. Mm -hmm. I went through the unconscious bias as the entire executive leadership team. We also had another uh, training program called professionalism and performance. I call it respect. It was how to treat someone mm -hmm. and a duty to call if you see bad behavior. It was a five hour class. I went through it. The entire executive leadership team went through it. And we trained and we're training all of our management people on this. It's really, really important to, to train people on the expectations and then hold them accountable to that. It's just not one and done though, is it? No. You have to, it's, 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 it is, it, it's constant and important. Right. It's our job. Right. 
So you're going to do something annually? Yeah. So you're going to do it. It will be refreshing. Time. And new new programs too. So we have a, a new um, HR leader just brought in, moved our, our, our incumbent, Charlene Thomas, moved into a new role. I created um, a chief diversity, equity, and inclusion officer reporting directly to me. That's a statement, right? Yeah, absolutely. Now we've got an executive officer in that role. And then we brought in a new HR leader from outside the company who's really got some great ideas on how we're going to continue to invest in, in leadership development for our folks. HR's taken on a whole different whole corporate different. sense these yes, days, right? Has. I mean, it used to be different. Today yes. it's, it's right at the It's strategic. Level. It's a strategic imperative. Right. Well, good. Um, Last question, and then we'll, we'll okay. switch over to the audience. So preparing for the future. Yes. Thankfully, thankfully, we can start to look ahead. <laughs> and uh, beyond COVID, and by the way, we are sitting far enough apart. We, you know, we talked about this. And um, so we're, we're- We're good. Yep, we're cool. We're good. So, um, but how are you future-proofing UPS? Yeah. You know, drones, are you doing autonomous vehicles? What's, yeah. what's your plan 10 years from now? So there are a few things we're doing. One is to be really, really honest about vulnerabilities and where we need to shore up those vulnerabilities. Because by doing so, you actually create opportunities for growth. If you don't, others take a little piece of your pie because they prey on your, on your vulnerability. Right. So for example, one of our areas of growth is small and medium-sized businesses. We love that customer segment. They value our end-to-end -end network. I will tell you though, we're tough to do business with. We got a lot of friction along the journey. So we've put together 16 customer journeys to eliminate friction. That's a vulnerability actually, but it gives us competitive advantage. Like I'll give you an example. Our billing system is something that we built. So it's a hand built billing system, 20 years old, horrible experience. We're replacing that with a um, SaaS uh, solution, Paymentus, uh, not to give them a plug, but I just did. Paymentus um, is a right. SaaS solution. And when we compare the capabilities of Paymentus against every competitor out there, far ex uh, superior experience. So by leaning into that, you actually leapfrog the competition and hopefully the customers will come with you and, and, and stick with you. So that's a big piece of our strategic focus yeah. right now. Kind of, uh, we're in many ways a fortress company, but we don't have a moat around our fortress. We've got these barrier islands and it's how you shore, shore, share up, shore up the barrier islands to protect yourself. Then it's about, okay, where do we grow? How do we think about growth? We are underpenetrated outside the United States. DHL is the, is the player outside the United States. So we're like, oh, hello. They've got huge growth opportunities um, outside the United States. So we are really leaning in and we'll have outpaced growth in terms of the capital allocation to our businesses outside the US. Another area is healthcare. This is important business for us. It's a very important business for us. It's not a package, it's a patient. You gotta do it right. So we've invested in the quality to make sure we're doing it right. Um, it, it's pretty exciting. You know, if you look ahead, 50% of all pharmaceutical cells will, uh, will be biologics, which means they really do need cold chain logistics to mm -hmm. move them around. Right. There's no reason why we shouldn't be the number one player in this space. Absolutely no reason why. So that's kind of cool too. Because yes. it, what you hear me saying is that it's very targeted growth rather than just give me a package. You know, there's some packages. Our largest uh, customer is Amazon. They're, Amazon's growing. And there's some of those packages I do not want. Those little one pound boxes. <laughs> you know, when I order a tube of lipstick, I do not want UPS delivery in that. I do we not. do, do that. We, we do do that. that. And I don't want to deliver it because I can't make any money on it. So I want Amazon to deliver that and we'll deliver the right. other things. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, that's exciting. I know I said that was the last question, but I'm going to ask you one more question. A little bit a personal question, um, because I know a little bit about it. Your foundation. Yes. Why don't you tell everybody about your foundation and kind of what your, your passions are? Yeah, so we had these really grandiose ideas of going into rural America and creating ecosystems and bringing rural America back to life, which is still the right. big vision. Right. 
But Ramon and I sat down and said, okay, now that you've got this full-time gig, <laughs> not sure we can go there right now. Right. So I'm very blessed in that, you know, Barbara Daniels, she yes. worked for, oh. for, with me at Home Depot for 20 years. She came here to help me on board. She's just gone back to run the foundation with Ramon. Great. And it was wonderful. I'm glad to have her in the foundation. So together we're building a website and we're focusing on Tomei Scholars. And Tomei Scholars, much like the Gate Millennium Scholars, that's a, our goal. We'll never be like them, but that's <laughs> our goal. We'll be focused on providing full ride scholarships to students in the areas of STEAM. Um, really at any college of their choice, although we are focused on certain colleges where we're endowing programs. Um, and then we're also doing it in uh, schools, rural schools. So those rural kids, if they, have a, if they have a dream to get to MIT and they don't know how they'll ever do it, we'll pay for it. So we're super awesome. excited about that. And we're gonna do it, we're gonna do it for technical schools too, because it's a, we need plumbers and electricians right, too. Right. But we're like, we can do Tomei Scholars that will have an immediate impact. Then we'll get all these Tomei Scholar alumni and they can come together and do good things in the world. So that's what we're doing right now. And then we'll take it from there. Nice, yeah. well, wonderful. Yeah. I knew you were doing something. Yeah, it's exciting. Sure it's it's super exciting, yeah. That's great, yeah. well. You're the best. Um, Betsy, would you like to bring up some questions from the audience? Uh, absolutely. And we've had a lot of them. Uh, really good. I bet. And for me, very entertaining. It has. Y'all are cute. Yes. Anyway, uh, uh, one of our members is interested in Carol's view of the United States Post Service, whether they're specifically, whether they're a partner or competitor of yours. And what do you see as their best role in the US? Well, we think it's important that the United States have a healthy postal system. Uh, the post office is a competitor, they are a customer and they are a supplier. So it's a very unique relationship, right. isn't it? We are their largest customer, oh, by the way. Isn't that interesting? Really? Yes, we are. Okay. Um, and they compete with us every day for that small and medium sized business customer. So, it's a very unique relationship. It's an important relationship. And again, we want the art, we believe our country should have a healthy postal system. We do not think, however, that the government should give them subsidies that would give them a competitive leg up because we wouldn't get those subsidies. Now, if the government wanted to give us those subsidies, we still wouldn't take them. We don't think that's right. We think you need to earn your right. And there are a lot of ways they could earn their right, we believe, uh, by looking at their costing methodology. Because the way they allocate costs, they actually uh, price under cost for some of their products. So if they just got their costing methodology, and we've been very public about this, so I'm not sharing with you anything that I shouldn't be. But if they got their costing methodology correct, they could actually, actually help themselves get to a better place financially. Maybe you can give them the lipstick business. Yeah, <laughs> I'd love for them to have the lipstick business. <laughs> yeah, because really, I, first class mail is going to go by the by, right? Right. So it is those lighter weight packages that they could deliver. Right. Um, you often point to the Peter Drucker quote that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Could you expand on why you feel so strongly about it? Well, I, I really use my Home Depot experience as the best example for that. During the last uh, recession, not the pandemic recession, but the last recession that was driven by the financial crisis and the housing crisis, Home Depot felt that crisis and they felt it hard. They lost $13 billion of sales, about 25% of their top line, just wiped off. And we had to make some really hard decisions during that time really hard decisions. We closed stores, we exited businesses, and those were hard. But we stayed true to our culture. You know, something that Bernie Marcus said, one of our founders, he said, and I go back and forth between what color I'm wearing, so now I'm wearing orange, but he said, he said, you know, if you take care of your customers, excuse me, if you take care of your associates, they'll take care of their customers and everything else takes care of itself. So in that crisis, when we were, making these really hard decisions, we decided to continue to pay merit increases to our hourly associate base. We continued to make contributions into 401k plans, and we continue to pay a bonus we called success sharing. This is for the hourly associates, not for the executives, for us, we froze everything. But for the hourly uh, associates, we invested in them because we believe that if we invested in them, stay true to that culture, take care of your associates, that when we got through the downturn, they'd be there for us to take care of our customers 
and the business would come back. And it proved positive. You know, Home Depot recovered all of those sales and a lot more since then. And it, it just it just resonated with me, the importance of putting your people first. So that's why I, I talk about it a lot. And, you know, now coming to UPS, this company was founded by Jim Casey um, 114 years ago, and he was a very forward thinking business leader who instilled incredible values. And you stay true to those values, good things happen. You stray from them, not such good things happen. So if you just go back to that, that culture that are grounded in values, you can, you can get through anything and come out even stronger. In the Wall Street Journal article, uh, it was said, it's interesting that you weren't interviewed for that, that your business philosophy is servant leadership. And uh, I wanted to, to ask you about that and, and maybe get you to expand a little bit on what they said and whether it's true. Yeah, so absolutely it's, it's true. Um, I'm not here for me. I'm here for everybody else. This is not about me. It's about everybody else. And I believe that, you know, the this is this responsibility that comes as a CEO is an enormous responsibility because you're responsible for people's lives. Mm -hmm. It's not just the value that you create for shareholders or destroy if you don't do it right. It's lives that you're responsible for. So, you know, if you go back to my Home Depot days and what Bernie and Arthur, you know, drilled into my brain is the power of the inverted management construct where the leaders are at the bottom of the construct because we bear the weight for the actions that we take and the decisions that we make. We bear that weight. And we do so, so that our associates, our employees who are at the top of the pyramid, well, we empower them to take care of their customers, to do the right thing. We empower them because we're bearing the weight. And you lose sight of that, you just lose, just, you just lose your way. This is not a job. If you if you think that you should be here at the top and your people should be at the bottom, this is just no, no. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't. You cannot do. You cannot do. You cannot achieve your your goals if you don't have your people with you. And the only way you have your people with you is you put them first. Uh, another question was, how does UPS monitor mentors? Uh, for diverse employees, how do how you you said you hold people responsible? How how exactly do you do that? So it's something that's changing. Um, we've had a commitment to diversity and inclusion for decades, but I I would say in many ways it was a commitment not necessarily followed up with action. For example, we tended to um, value seniority over talent. And oftentimes that meant that jobs, when the jobs became available, we would not post the job, but we would put someone into the job, someone who'd been around for a while, who had held a number of different jobs, who was senior. It was their turn. It was their turn. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, that's not, that doesn't foster diversity and inclusion, because if you don't post the jobs, then you don't know who, you don't get a chance to meet people that you don't even know who could be really good in those jobs. Mm -hmm. So we started posting the jobs uh, for our senior most level uh, uh, positions and it's been fantastic. It's been great. We've been exposed to people that we never would have thought as, as a potential candidate for the job. And if they didn't get the job, we've identified them as people that we want to invest in. And we're requiring a diverse slate. It doesn't mean that the, you, you're gonna pick the best candidate, of course. So it may not be a diverse person who gets the role, but I'm demanding a diverse slate. You it's all about intentionality. It's all about intentionality. That's why when the, when the board composition that I mentioned, the, the, new, right. the new directors, that was in, those were intentional moves, right. not just happenstance, they were intentional moves. Um, we've had a question asking for um, your UPS's views on uh, green ESG initiatives and the um, challenge of uh, a BlackRock uh, to combat climate change. Yeah, so interestingly, before I came downstairs, I just spent 30 minutes with Larry Fink, 
you know, a CEO of BlackRock. So the question is so timely. And we talked about a number of different things, uh, including ESG, particularly like climate change. Now, I, I think if you break down ESG to just uh, sustainability, which is a part of the ESG, we've had sustainable goals outstanding for a number of years, and we've made some good progress against those goals. But I don't think they're bold enough. I don't think they are aggressive enough. And so we are rethinking our sustainability goals. Now, we have a lot of action underway too. Uh, one out of every four vehicles uses some sort of an alternate fuel. Uh, we ordered 10,000 electric vehicles in the UK um, through a company called Arrivals. We um, just, I just approved a new uh, investment in a battery powered aircraft for feeder routes. You're a pilot. Oh, yes. Yes. Nice. Would, you, would you fly a battery powered sure, aircraft? Sure okay, okay, cool. So we've got it. We just approved that, which is pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, we had the first drone airline approved by the FAA in the country. So we, we are, have been investing in sustainability, but we don't have those big, bold targets. You know, the big, bold targets that I'm talking about, which would be net zero by 2050. We don't have those big, bold targets out yet, but we are exploring them because what I know in 30 years, things are going to change. Yeah. Things are going to change. And we consume a lot of carbon in our company. Our drivers drive over 2 billion miles a year on the road. That's a lot of carbon, right? We fly a lot of aircraft. We own about 300 aircraft. We fly over 500 through leases every day. You know, we have 180 flights a week between China and the United States. It's a lot of carbon that we're consuming, right? So we've got it. We have to. We have to do this. You know, we signed the pledge that was the business roundtable pledge that we know we're going to do the right thing for all stakeholders because I believe that is right. You know, the paradox is if you do the right thing for all stakeholders, you actually create value for share owners. Right. You know, I used to not understand that, but I, now I really get it. If you do the, if you really take care of the needs of all stakeholders, you create value for the share owner. Fascinating. Um, we've had a question. Um, how do small innovators get consideration at UPS? I'm assuming as a vendor. So, right. It's always hard, right? To, as you're a small innovator to come into a large company like us. Um, that being said, we do have something called UPS Ventures. And UPS Ventures, we take minority interests in small companies if we think there's some sort of a connection to us. We also participate in Engage, which is that joint venture fund that was uh, led by Georgia Tech and a, a, a few others. So we participate that way. Um, and we do have a procurement organization that's focused on uh, supplier diversity. So through the procurement organization, there's a way to come in if you're a small, particularly if you're a um, um, minority or woman-owned business, there'd be a way to come in through that as, as well. That's great. Um, here's a, a question that's a good question. We're celebrating International Women's Day next week in Women's History Month throughout the March, uh, month of March. Reflecting back on your own journey, uh, do you have advice to business women about how best to reach their full potential? In two seconds or less. No. <laughs> Take whatever time you need, but that's a big question. Yeah. You know, I, I long for the day where women are no longer a special interest group, but we still are. Right. So let's celebrate. Yeah. <laughs> let's celebrate in the month of March. And yeah, what, how do you, you know, Connie, I could ask you that question. What's your advice for women to, to reach their high? You, you're highly successful. What's your advice? Talk to people, meet Talk people, people, network people with people. Yeah. What do you think? Totally think. Okay. You got, you cannot do it by yourself. Don't think you can. You can be, you can be extraordinarily accomplished in your craft, whatever your craft may be. But if you haven't ex established a strong network, it just doesn't work. Right. It just doesn't work. So you got to really network. And we have so many opportunities to network because we can do it in organizations like this. Mm -hmm. uh, we can do it in your kid's school or in church or, or, uh, or any community involvement that you might engage in. There are lots of ways to network, but I think it's critically, critically important. This had, do I have time? Do I have time yeah, to no, tell a story? Okay. Second. All right. Because very I want to share, share the story with you because I think it's so very cool. So mine is, you know, my mom passed away. She passed away in September and last week would have been her 90th birthday. So my sister sent us um, books that were in my mother's handwriting, her journals 
that were her poems and her reflections and prayers and all this really lovely thing. Oh, nice. But she also sent a photo book. And in the photo book was a photo, a four generation photo of my great grandmother, my grandmother, my mother and me when I was a baby. And I looked at that photo, which I had never seen before. And I thought about these four women. My great grandmother was in a wagon train who homesteaded in Wyoming on a wagon train. My grandmother lost her husband when her, my mother was four years old, worked every single day until she died. She walked to work in her high heels, never owned a car, never owned a home. My mother ended up being an, an incredible uh, philanthropist who really changed the state of Jackson, Wyoming, and ended up when she passed, leaving an estate worth millions of dollars for her, her kids and grandkids. And now I'm running UPS. And to think about what's happened in four generations, I'm like, it's just, I mean, I just think it's so cool. It is very we cool. think we haven't come very far, but then I look at the four generations of that photo that I'm in, and I'm like, my great grandmother was on the wagon train. I mean, that's pretty cool. I think it's awesome. Yeah. And I, and I think it is absolute testament to the fact that anybody can do anything. Anything. Yeah. And anything. Just ask somebody for help yes. would be my other suggestion is yes. talk to somebody, ask them for help. Yeah. Um, okay. So, cause I'm in the real estate business, I'm going to ask you one more question, I think, and then we're about done. So, uh, you know, everybody's been working from home for I so know. long. Your parking lot's empty. I you guys have been working from home for a long time. We think in the real estate community that there are things that you miss not being together. And we've touched a little bit on that. Yes. You miss, you miss loyalty, you miss culture, and you miss a little bit of productivity. What do you see? Do you agree with that would be my first question. Do you agree with those three things? I do. Okay. When do you plan to bring people back? And are so, you going to come back at full strength? Yeah, such a great question, because it's one of the big things we wrestle with, right? Yeah. We've also been listening to our, our workers who said, you know, this is really working for me. This is so much better for me. I don't have a two hour commute. I have time, you know, to make dinner for my family or to deal with my kids or whatever it may be. I really want to stay at home. <coughs> Excuse me for coughing. I don't have COVID. There's some water. Down Thank you. you want. So we're like, all right, understanding that workers don't want to come back. Understanding we don't want to lose loyalty and connectivity and productivity. We're going to have, we're going to move to a hybrid. Okay. So we're not going to ever come back the way we were ever. We don't have, I don't, and I don't have it fu fully formulated what it's going to look like, but we have this building we're in today. We have a building next door and then we have a building that's um, up the street a bit. We're going to collapse those three buildings into one. Oh, wow. Now you're in the real estate okay. business. <laughs> So those buildings, those buildings are going to get sold. Those two buildings that we're going to leave are going to get sold. Okay. We're going to collapse into one and we'll be hoteling here and we'll have enough space. So for big events, well, we, you know, we've got some big space here. Yeah. So we'll have enough space that we can bring people together, but we're, it's going to be different. And I don't think I'm alone in this. I don't think I'm alone in this. Well, I think, uh, I think you've made, it sounds like you've made that decision. And I think a lot of people are looking for other people. What's everybody else doing? To do and it. I, I get asked that question a hundred times. I'm now going to tell them what Carol's doing yeah, and at UPS. We are, we've told people not, don't expect any change and you're going to work remotely until September 1st. Okay. Uh, so that gets us way through the vaccines and, you know, yep. kids back to school and all that good stuff. And, but it's going to be different. That's awesome. I know. I am like, oh, it's got to let go of the edge of the pool, right? Yeah. Got to do it. Well, somebody's got to make that decision. Yeah. And yeah. it, it appears to be that's the way everybody's feeling about it. So if you want to be an employer of choice and you got to listen to your people yeah. and they're, you got to listen to them. Right. Right. And it's been a good sample. experiment. Yeah, <laughs> experiment is the right word. It's been, <laughs> yeah. Who knew, but it's been great. Who knew? Well, Bessie, I'm going to turn it back over yeah, to you. So, you have, um, yeah. We're at the end of our time and wow, what a terrific session this has been. Carol, thank you so much for being with us today and sharing your thoughts on work, life, and logistics. Your comments were really thoughtful uh, and provocative for the rest of us. So truly, it, it was just a joy to see this interview. And Connie, great job, as usual. Great job, <laughs> great job.